It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. And uh, for those of you who may be somewhat perplexed by why a pediatric endocrinologist is speaking to you, I'm dual trained in internal medicine and adult endocrinology and in pediatric endocrinology. So feel free to ask me questions from every age up uh, and I'll do my best to answer. Those of you who may have wandered in late, this is not the talk on firearm safety. This is the talk on hypocalcemia and hypoparathyroidism. And as I look around, I see we have a small audience. And that's a good thing. Because for the most part, the folks here, I assume, represent surgical misadventure. Uh, and as we talk about uh, during this afternoon's presentation, we'll see that about 75% of the hypoparathyroidism that occurs in the United States and around the world is the result of some surgical uh, misadventure that has led to either removal or destruction of the parathyroid glands. Let me also mention that I am available for questions after my presentation through the internet through the, one, uh, the wonders of the World Wide Web, you can contact me by email at Levine, L-E-V-I-N-E-M, as in Michael, at C-H-O-P dot E-D-U. So Levine M at chop dot E-D-U. And if you do email me, just indicate in the message that you attended my talk here, and that will put me into the right perspective. So let's see if we can go down. Good. Uh, by way of disclosure, I should tell you that I have been an investigator uh, with NADPARA by NPS. Anybody here uh, a participant in any of those studies with PTH 1 to 84? OK, we'll be talking about some of that. Let me give you a little bit of history. This is a rhinoceros, and it has particular importance uh, in the world of parathyroid disease because the parathyroids, there are four of them in our neck, and the parathyroid glands were the last endocrine glands to be discovered. They were discovered in the mid-19th century during a necropsy of an Indian rhinoceros that had died at the London Zoo. And Sir Richard Owen described these in a uh, small little uh, paper that he wrote. And really, no one took much note uh, of this publication. And it wasn't until several years later that a medical student by the name of Ivar Sandstrom identified parathyroid glands in humans. And he was doing a medical student research project looking at the anatomy of the neck in dogs first and dis discovered these unusual glands that he didn't know what they did. And then he went to do some autopsies in humans and found that humans had these same glands. And he presented his findings uh, in Sweden at a scientific congress. Uh, and uh, after his presentation, everyone seemed to be quite bored. Uh, he wasn't able to tell anybody what the glands did. And he was so crushed by the lack of interaction with the audience that he left science altogether and became a general practice physician. It wasn't until 1908 and 1906 that some function to these glands was ascribed. And here, Jacob Erdheim, a pathologist, did some experiments again in dogs and removed the parathyroid glands from dogs. And within a day, the dogs had tetany. Now, I'm sure the dogs didn't complain of tingling in their paw tips and around their nose, their snout, and their mouth. Uh, but they went into tetany nevertheless. And over the next 20 or 30 years, it was determined that if you gave these dogs an infusion of calcium, you could reverse the tetany, and if you put them on doses of vitamin D and calcium, you could prevent tetany. So that brought us up to about the 1920s, 1930s, and there was recognition that you needed these glands. One gland would be enough to maintain a normal serum calcium, 
uh, and a normal serum phosphorus. But if you didn't have any of the four glands, you had hypoparathyroidism with a low blood calcium level, an elevated phosphorus level, and tingling and muscle cramps. So this gives us our definition of hypoparathyroidism. And it's a clinical disorder characterized by a low calcium and an elevated phosphorus. And this is important because some patients with mild hypoparathyroidism will have only an elevated phosphate. And their calcium may be within the normal range, but there might be times during the day when the calcium level goes down and a patient develops symptoms. I think this also draws our attention to the fact that when your doctor, your care provider, is monitoring you and following your biochemical tests, they have to measure the phosphorus as well as the calcium. For as you'll see during my, my talk about management, the, the true management of hypocalcemia in a patient with hypoparathyroidism is really managing the phosphate. And if you and your clinical provider don't pay attention to the phosphate, you'll never get the calcium just right. So phosphorus is important. And whenever you get a blood test, not only should you be looking at the calcium level, but you also must be looking at the serum phosphorus level. Now, as I said, uh, most patients with hypoparathyroidism have damage to the parathyroid glands or inadvertent removal as a consequence of surgical misadventure. And there are about 60,000 patients in the United States with hypoparathyroidism. Um, and most of these patients are female, and that's because most thyroid surgery and parathyroid surgery occurs in women. Um, so in most cases, it's surgery, but in about a quarter of cases, it may be due to a genetic defect or some other medical problem that causes the parathyroid glands to function abnormally. So I'm going to go over a list of whys and wherefores with you. And these are, I think, some of the points that you need to know and be aware about in order to collaborate with your physician provider in order to manage your hypoparathyroidism satisfactorily. You have to know why you have hypoparathyroidism. And as I said, for most of you, uh, you'll remember the day you had surgery. You have to know what features are associated with hypoparathyroidism. In some cases, this may be due to the neck surgery, so you might have hypothyroidism in addition to hypoparathyroidism, but there are some genetic syndromes that include hypoparathyroidism, but also include additional features that you may need to discuss with your physician so that you get adequately screened. You need to know the signs and symptoms so that you understand and family members understand when your calcium level is too low and when your calcium level is too high. And you need to know your treatment options. And we'll talk more about the expanding number of treatment options toward the end of the talk. You need to know the complications to make sure that your physicians are monitoring you appropriately. And again, all of this brings us to the point that you and your physician must work collaboratively as a team. And the reason for this is you probably know more about hypoparathyroidism than most physicians. Most physicians don't take care of more than one patient with hypoparathyroidism. And there are some endocrinologists who don't take care of more than a handful. So empowering yourself through knowledge, working collaboratively with your physician is going to, I think, assure you of the best outcome. So surgical hypoparathyroidism occurs in about one out of 200 cases in experienced surgical hands. If you have gone to a surgeon that does one case a year, uh, that surgeon's uh, rate of hypoparathyroidism could be two, three, or even 5%. 
But throughout the U.S., the rate is about one case out of 200, so 0.5%. Important to note that many patients will have something called transient hypoparathyroidism that occurs directly following a neck surgery and which lasts for upwards of six months. So if you or your loved one has hypoparathyroidism following surgery and it's been more than six months since surgery, that's permanent hypoparathyroidism. The likelihood of permanent hypoparathyroidism normalizing spontaneously is extremely unlikely. Now, in terms of non-surgical causes, I'm probably going to breach HIPAA here, create a HIPAA violation. But is anyone in this room, does anyone in this room have hypoparathyroidism that is not surgical? OK, wow. So this you can just file away for a conversation at some cocktail party. But there are other causes of hypoparathyroidism. And if you don't want to tell somebody that you have hypoparathyroidism because of surgery, you can say that there's a lot of iron in the pipes in your house, and all that iron has gotten into your parathyroid glands. And that stopped your parathyroid glands from working. You've stopped up your parathyroid glands. Things that you need to know about, because even with surgical hypoparathyroidism, the function of what may remain of your parathyroids or your ability to respond to PTH if you do start that therapy uh, next year is your magnesium level. So you also need to make sure that your magnesium level is normal. And it's not because magnesium is necessary to absorb calcium. It's because cells require magnesium in order to work properly. And the cells that respond to PTH require normal magnesium levels. So you need to have a normal magnesium level in addition to a normal calcium level. Some patients have extreme burn injuries. That can cause transient hypoparathyroidism. When they recover from their burns, the parathyroid glands work normally. And then there are genetic disorders, and it appears that nobody here has one of those disorders. I study those, uh, and I'm most interested in the genes that cause the parathyroid glands to either not develop properly during embryogenesis, during fetal development, or genetic defects that cause the parathyroids to be present but not work properly. So let's talk about associated features. There are some patients who have autoimmune hypoparathyroidism. There's autoimmune thyroid disease. There's lupus, which is an autoimmune disease that affects many tissues. And then, of course, there are some patients who develop antibodies that either destroy their parathyroid glands or limit the function of their parathyroid glands. And those patients are at risk of developing antibodies to additional organs, endocrine organs and other tissues. So if you or someone you know has autoimmune hypoparathyroidism, then they need to be monitored for the development of also fungal infections of the fingernails and, and skin problems with the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands may stop working in some of these patients. And some patients will develop vitiligo, loss of skin pigment in certain spots on their body. So there's a strong association between autoimmune endocrine disorders and vitiligo. So these are some of the associations between autoimmune hypoparathyroidism. And again, if you don't have this condition, no worries. This shows you some of the features in, on the fingernails. I'm not sure you can see the pitting, little pits on the fingernails. And there's also some pitting here on the teeth. We used to uh, see in textbooks that patients with hypoparathyroidism would have enamel defects in their teeth. Uh, and it turns out that's true, but only in certain forms of hypoparathyroidism. And it's the autoimmune form of hypoparathyroidism. So patients with post-surgical hypoparathyroidism have very strong teeth, and they have very strong bones. 
one of the benefits, if you, if you might uh, allow me to use that term, one of the benefits of having hypoparathyroidism is that it's unlikely you'll develop osteoporosis. Bone mass is increased in patients with hypoparathyroidism. So that's one of the few benefits, I think. Now let's talk about signs and symptoms, and here I'm sort of bringing Coles to Newcastle. Um, I've told you about increased bone mass, that's a good thing. Increased levels of serum phosphorus, not such a good thing. And the reason for that is if your calcium level is low, but your phosphorus level is very high, then if you multiply those two numbers called the calcium phosphorus product, it should be less than 55. This is why you need to know your serum phosphorus level. If your product is less than 55, you are not at risk of developing basal ganglion calcifications, cataracts, and calcifications in other tissues. So you want to make sure that your calcium concentration times your phosphorus concentration is less than 55. And you can't do that calculation unless you know both of those numbers. If the product of those two numbers is over 70, then you are at big risk of getting calcifications in the brain that can cause a Parkinson's-like syndrome and also calcifications in the eyes that causes cataracts. So know your calcium phosphorus product. And then what about other manifestations of low PTH? People talk about brain fog. I'm sure you've all heard the term. And some people think, well, this might be a manifestation of low PTH rather than a manifestation of low calcium. The jury is still out on this. Uh, and we're looking, I think, uh, with extreme interest in what features of hypoparathyroidism might be due to the absence of PTH rather than a low serum calcium level. So stay tuned. I think we'll have more information about that in the coming years. But we're always interested in you know, your feedback, how you feel when your calcium level is normal, and whether you have brain fog even under that circumstance. Let me also remind you that about 50% of the calcium in your blood is bound to a protein. And that protein is called albumin. And so if your albumin level is low, that will cause the 50%. So here you've got, this shows you all three compartments of calcium in the blood. There's ionized calcium, which is what we call the biologically active calcium. And when the ionized calcium is low, you have symptoms of hypocalcemia. And when the ionized calcium is high, you have symptoms of hypercalcemia. So it's the ionized calcium that's really the biologically active form of calcium. But it's hard to measure an ionized calcium. It has to be measured in a sample that is collected without any air in the tube, and it must be measured within minutes. It can't be left in a tube and then shipped halfway across the country. So if you're going to get an ionized calcium, it has to be analyzed rapidly within minutes of the blood being taken from your body. So this is difficult. So we measure total calcium, which is what I'm looking at here. So this is total calcium. And half of the total calcium represents calcium that's bound to a protein, albumin, and that just allows it to exist in the blood almost as a reservoir for the ionized calcium. Because the ionized calcium and the protein-bound calcium can be exchanged. Okay, They're, It's a dynamic relationship. But if, for some reason, your blood level of albumin goes down, and that's what I've drawn in this picture, so here the albumin level is low, the total calcium will be low, but you won't have symptoms because the ionized calcium level has not been changed. That's in this green here. Okay? And then if a tourniquet stays on your arm too long, 
Has anybody ever had that, a problem with a blood draw and the tourniquet is on the arm for what seems to be forever? When a tourniquet is on the arm for a long time, it causes concentration of the proteins in the blood in your arm. And when that blood is removed, the concentration of albumin now is higher than it really is in your body because the tourniquet was on a long time. And when that happens, as shown here in this middle, the albumin concentration is high. The total calcium that's measured will also be high. And somebody might think that your real blood calcium level is too high. So what we physicians do is a little quick calculation, and we get what's called the albumin-adjusted serum calcium. So when you're talking to your physician about your blood calcium level, you can ask, is that number my albumin-adjusted serum calcium level? And then your physician might say, oh, oh, well, what's that? And then you'll say, well, you have to know what my albumin level is in that blood sample because if the tourniquet was on too long, the albumin level may be artificially high and that can be misleading and make you think my calcium level is higher than it really is. And the importance for that is what if you are having symptoms of a low calcium level and the tourniquet stays on too long, the albumin level goes up and now the total calcium looks normal and you're saying, but I feel terrible. Your physician is going to think, oh, you're, you're just crazy. When in fact, if they did the albumin-adjusted serum calcium level, they would see that your calcium level is really low. So I've told you, you need to know your phosphorus as well as your calcium, and you need to know your albumin as well as your calcium. So now you can calculate your product, right? Your calcium phosphorus product to prevent cataracts. And you're going to calculate your albumin-adjusted serum calcium level so you know your real calcium level. Or if you're having this test done at a hospital, you can ask for the ionized calcium level. One la yes, question. Yes. So albumin and phosphorus and calcium, those three. Every check. Every check. Plus a urine calcium and creatinine, okay, at every check. Now, has anybody here ever developed symptoms of tetany or paresthesias after running up the stairs or after exercising or after jogging or dancing? Okay, we have some answers. Okay, some hands. Good. Here's what's happening. Here's what's happening. There's a dynamic balance between the ionized calcium and the protein-bound calcium. When you begin to exercise, you begin to breathe more rapidly, right? You're hyperventilating. That causes a change in the pH of your blood. Now, I know you know all about pH because shampoos are all about pH balance, right? So you know that when your pH is low, it's acid, and when your pH is high, it's alkaline. When you hyperventilate, you blow off all this carbon dioxide and your pH goes up. When your pH goes up, more ionized calcium is bound to albumin. So your total calcium doesn't change but the ionized changes, it goes down. So you will develop symptoms of hypocalcemia just from exercising or going to a Justin Bieber concert. So, you know, if, if, you know for, for those of you out there who are a little older, you may remember the Beatles, right? And there's that famous scene uh, on the Ed Sullivan show where those teenage girls are just screaming for the Beatles. Well, whenever, you know, teenage girls get all excited and they begin to hyperventilate, some of them go into tetany. And they go into tetany not because they've developed hypoparathyroidism, but because they've hyperventilated so severely that they've raised their pH and lowered their ionized calcium levels acutely, leading to tetany. Now, I'll tell you how we treat that. 
In, in today's world of high technology, we use a pigmented celluloid rebreathing device. 25 years ago, we called that a brown paper bag. Okay? A celluloid pigmented rebreathing device. Insurance companies will not pay for a brown paper bag, but they will go gaga for high tech. So if you are hyperventilating, dancing with the stars or something, and you develop acute hypocal, control your breathing. Be aware of how rapidly you're breathing. Slow down your breathing, and that will adjust your pH and bring your ionized calcium back into the proper number. So what are we talking about? Tingling in the hands, feet, or face. We're talking about sometimes calcium levels that go so low that you have a brain tetany, a seizure, uh, and then muscle cramps uh, and weakness. You know, some of the patients I treat are kids, and their parents will call me and say, I think Johnny's calcium is too low. He can't walk because it's so severe. His muscles are locked up. Yes, ma'am. It could be. So if your calcium level is low enough, it can cause symptoms of asthma with bronchospasm. It can cause laryngospasm. These are typically symptoms that we see in younger children, but it can occur in anybody if the calcium is low enough. And remember, sometimes after thyroid surgery, one of the recurrent laryngeal nerves can be damaged. So one of the vocal cords may be paralyzed or not work so well. Right? And so that obstructs the airway. And now you've got 50% of the opening that you had before that surgery. So you would be more susceptible to closure if your calcium goes low. So if you do develop those sorts of symptoms, make sure it's not your calcium because that's easy to treat. Of course. So this is the tetany uh, sign, the trostic sign. And you can do this on yourself. You can stand in front of a mirror and you can tap the, your, your cheek. And if you see this response, you know your calcium level is too low. Now, this is different than tickling. You can't tickle yourself. But you can do this to yourself. And you can check for your own Schwastik sign. So I encourage everyone to do it. You know, if you, if you think you may be a little low, you can confirm it by, by just tapping. And the easiest way to learn how to do that is to just tap somebody near you until you get a little twitch. Even people with normal calcium levels will give a little twitch. This is what we call the Elvis Presley sign. Yes. Ah, yes, right. So it could be it could be facial twitches would be a sign of tetany. I would look for a Chvostek sign. If his Chvostek sign was negative and you knew you were doing it properly, the facial tics might be due to something else. But it certainly could be a sign of a low calcium level. So that's a good point. And this, of course, is called uh, Trousseau sign. Has anyone ever had this happen to their hands? OK. So this sometimes happens if the blood pressure cuff is left on your arm a little too long. Um, and we do it as a test by putting the blood pressure cuff up there above the systolic, which is the upper number in your blood pressure, and leaving it for what is called the longest three minutes in medicine. And if your hand begins to do this, it means your calcium level is too low. This is also called the accoucheur, which is a French term for the obstetrician's hand. Uh, some of you out there may recognize why it's called that. Okay. Now, the other, other manifestations of hypoparathyroidism and hypocalcemia can be increased pressure in the brain. So if you're having severe headaches every day, every day, then it could be because of increased intracranial pressure that sometimes occurs in patients with a low calcium and hypoparathyroidism, also associated with hypothyroidism. So some of you may have two reasons to be concerned uh, about 
headaches that occur every day. And you may want to suggest to your doctor that you be evaluated for benign intracranial hypertension if these headaches have come out of nowhere and just are every day and are making you sick. Hypocalcemia can also worsen heart failure. Uh, and this is easily reversible by normalizing the calcium level. And sometimes we can even do an EKG and we can see changes on the EKG that tell us the calcium level is too low. So there are a number of other features of hypocalcemia and hypoparathyroidism. This is basal gas. Yes, question. What, what did you call it? Benign intracranial hypertension high pressure in the head. So I talked about the calcium phosphorus product. All of this white stuff here, all of this white stuff here, represents calcium deposits in the brain in an individual whose calcium phosphorus product was over 70 for years and years and years. And this patient probably also had cataracts. So you don't want this. And I don't recommend you run out and get a CAT scan because you can't do anything about the calcifications once they're there. What you can do is work with your provider to make sure that your calcium phosphorus product is under 55. So treatment options, let's talk about treatment options. So how many folks here take calcium every day? Just about everyone. How many of you take it with meals? Okay, we've got some work to do here. So taking calcium serves two purposes. One, by taking calcium, you sort of even out day-to-day -day differences in the intake of calcium from your diet. If you didn't take any calcium, your dietary calcium intake could be very variable. If one day you had ice cream and the next day you didn't, one day you had two glasses of milk and the next day you didn't, you'd have these variations that would cause fluctuations in your serum calcium level. So taking 1,000 milligrams, for example, of calcium every day provides you with a buffer. So that's one important reason to be taking calcium, to sort of buffer out changes in your daily dietary calcium intake. But number two, and what I think is even more important, is to bind up phosphorus in your GI tract. And the only way that calcium can do that is if you take the calcium when you're introducing the phosphorus into your body. And when is that? During your meals. So you should be taking the calcium supplements with the meals. That will prevent phosphorus from being absorbed and that will help control your serum phosphorus level. So if you're not taking calcium with meals, discuss that with your physician. And if your physician doesn't believe you, have your physician contact me and I will tell them why you need to take calcium with your meals. The second, the second thing that you're probably all taking now is some form of vitamin D, an activated form of vitamin D, calcitriol. Show of hands, how many on calcitriol? Okay, and are you taking that once a day or twice a day? You need to take it twice a day. It's a short-acting drug. It lasts about 12 hours. So you can get away with using less and getting a more stable serum calcium if you use it twice a day as opposed to once a day. When you use a short-acting drug once a day, you have to give so much, then your calcium level shoots way up high, and then over the day, it sort of slowly comes down. If you use the drug twice a day, it comes up to here instead of here. And then as it comes down, 12 hours later, you take your next dose. Make sense? So it should be given twice a day, not once a day. Yes? Um, I, I take 2,400 milligrams of calcium every day. And so I, I take the extended release tablets with the vitamin D. And I frequently forget to take my lunchtime dose. So I take them both at night. But every day I get in my 2400. Is the calcium, as, um, like the calcitriol, is it, is it better to split it up? or does uh, it ex Excellent question. Ex so, it, it re so number one, we want to take the calcium with meals to bind the phosphate up. 
But we also want to take calcium several times during the day, and this is true whether you're treating hypoparathyroidism or osteoporosis, because calcium is absorbed, the levels go up quickly, and then they come back down three hours later. So extended release does provide a longer activity range because it's slowly being absorbed, so that's a good thing. But if you're using standard calcium, the effects are gone in about three hours. So if you take it with meals, not only are you binding up phosphorus, but also you're bolusing yourself several times during the day. And again, we know that in order to get a certain effect with any drug, if you use it once a day, you have to give much more than if you use the drug as a, as a multi-dose and then the total dose turns out to be less. So fewer side effects if you use a drug, whatever it is, with multiple doses rather than one. So why, why we all want to do once a day? It's convenient. Once a day is convenient. But it may not give you the optimal control you seek, whether it's high, whether it's high blood pressure or hypoparathyroidism. So for treating hypoparathyroidism, calcitriol should be twice a day. Calcium should be multiple times during the day. And the other thing about calcium is, and this is more, I think, germane for osteoporosis treatment, there's, a, there's a, only a certain amount of calcium that you can absorb at a time. So if you take too much calcium, you exceed the ability of the body to absorb it, and most of the calcium then just goes out down the toilet. So that's another reason to do it multiple times during the day, even for osteoporosis. Yes? Oh, uh, right. Yes, so, so levothyroxine, and Synthroid is the best-selling brand of levothyroxine, about 65% of it is absorbed on an empty stomach. If there's any iron or calcium or uh, other minerals present at the same time that you take your levothyroxine, it reduces the efficiency of absorption. We also know that levothyroxine is better absorbed when taken late at night rather than first thing in the morning. So I tell people this, I tell them, you should take it on an empty stomach, which means no, no food for two hours before, no food for two hours after. That may be difficult if, you're all, if you also have hypoparathyroidism. But the other thing that you can do is if you take it consistently, for example, if you knew that levothyroxine was optimally absorbed, 65%, on an empty stomach, but it was 50% absorbed if you took it with breakfast, if you took it with breakfast every day, you'd be consistent. You'd just be at 50%. So I tell people all the time, if we can't find a time during the day when you can take your levothyroxine on an empty stomach, let's find some other time when you're consistent with what you eat. And then I can manage the TSH level. I know whether I have to give you more or less levothyroxine following your TSH level, as long as you are consistent with what time of day you're taking it and the other things you're eating. So the easiest way is taking it on an empty stomach. But if that's not possible, the second position is consistent taking it. Yes? No, go ahead, absolutely. So, so this is a good question. This is a good question because it relates to the differences in activity of regular vitamin D versus calcitriol. So regular old vitamin D is not very active. And in order for regular old vitamin D to become active, to be, to be converted from vitamin D to a hormone, 
okay? Because calcitriol is a hormone. And those of you who've had your insurance companies refuse to cover calcitriol because it's a vitamin need to write a letter of appeal and remind them that calcitriol is a hormone. So the difference between vitamin D and calcitriol is that the vitamin D goes first to the liver where it is modified in the liver and then it becomes 25 hydroxy vitamin D and then it goes to the kidney where it becomes calcitriol but only if there's PTH around. So in the absence of PTH you can't make calcitriol. So as much vitamin D within reason that you would take you're not going to convert it to calcitriol. So if you're taking PTH or you have PTH in your body, just taking vitamin D is fine because you will convert that into calcitriol. Some patients have mild hypoparathyroidism and are making some PTH and can make some calcitriol and they may be able to maintain a normal serum calcium level just taking calcium supplements. Okay, so that would be a very mild case. But most patients who have severe hypoparathyroidism would have to take 50,000 or 100,000 units of vitamin D to get the equivalent action of 0 0.5 micrograms of calcitriol. Okay, 100,000 units of vitamin D, 0 0.5 micrograms of calcitriol. So most physicians have gone to using calcitriol rather than 100,000 units of vitamin D. But giving it twice a day, for regular old vitamin D, it's a very long half-life drug. So you can take regular old vitamin D once a week, okay? The calcitriol is a short half-life drug. And the benefit is if you become hypercalcemic, we can stop the calcitriol for a couple of days and your calcium comes back down. If I, in the old days, treated a patient with 100,000 units of plain old vitamin D every day, if they became hypercalcemic, it took weeks for their calcium level to normalize. And that's why most of us have switched to using calcitriol. Yes, hand in the back. Now, when you say you're vitamin, 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 40 and 60 is a little shifted, we like 30 and 50. And the reason for that is that there are some bad things that happen below 30 and some bad things that happen above 50. It doesn't mean that it's gonna be, happen to you, but if you look at a population, between 30 and 50 seems to be the sweet spot for a population. Well, good, well, good. So that's working for you. And, and I always say, you know, you don't fight with success. If it works, it works. So the big difference is Forteo. So you're on PTH. So for PTH to work, you need to have enough plain old vitamin D to convert it into calcitriol. So that's the difference. So if your 25 hydroxy vitamin D was in the teens, there wasn't enough for Forteo to convert to calcitriol. So by increasing your serum level of 25 hydroxy vitamin D, you gave Forteo enough substrate to work with. Okay? It's sort of like if I give you three bags of cement to build a brick house, but I don't give you any bricks, you're not going to be able to build a brick house. So for Forteo or NatPara or any form of PTH to work, it works by converting 25 hydroxy vitamin D to calcitriol. So if your level of 25 hydroxy vitamin D is low, the Forteo doesn't work. So that's the deal there. 
But for patients who are not on Forteo, moving your 25 hydroxy vitamin D level from 19 to 30 or 40 will not make a difference because you still can't convert it on your own to the calcitriol. Okay. So that's main, maintain normal serum level of 25 hydroxy vitamin D. For some people, that's going to be 2,000 units of vitamin D a day. For some people, it will be more. Yes. Well, it's, it, so, so there is a limit to how much you can absorb, and that's 500 to 600. This probably, you could probably go up to 1,000 milligrams of elemental calcium, and that also brings up a good point. Most supplements say calcium 500 or calcium 250, but some calcium supplements will tell you the weight of the calcium carbonate. So when you use a calcium supplement, and we're talking about taking calcium 500 milligrams, make sure that the tablet you're taking contains 500 milligrams of calcium and not 500 milligrams of calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate, which is Tums and Oscal, is the most common form of calcium, only contains 40% calcium. So if you took 1,000 milligrams of calcium carbonate, you only get 400 milligrams of calcium. So just look at the label very carefully. Another, another thing that people overlook is that some calcium supplements will say one serving provides 600 milligrams of calcium. <clears throat> and then you look on the label and it'll say one serving is three tablets. So be careful to make sure that A, we're talking calcium and not calcium carbonate, and B, we're talking that amount of calcium in one tablet. That's a big problem when I see patients all the time who tell me they're taking 500, 600 milligrams of calcium three times a day, I say, and they're not doing well. I say, bring in the container. We look on the back and it says 500 milligrams of calcium is a serving, serving size, three tablets. They've been taking one third of what they thought they were taking. So what's the target? Oh, yes. Sure. 10? It's 10 minutes. All right. I would, I would still recommend splitting it up and taking it with your food, because you're eating more than once a day, I guess. So it's better to take 300 three times a day, with, you know, 300 with each meal, than 1,000 with just one meal. Because what's happening to the phosphorus in the other two meals? You're absorbing all that phosphorus. So in 10 minutes, let me just talk about a few things. We won't have time, I think, to talk about PTH, but you'll be hearing more about that uh, later this year. We expect that the FDA will approve NADPARA, uh, which is a form of recombinant PTH for hypoparathyroidism. But let me just quickly point out two important features of hypoparathyroidism treatment, you need to know what your target level is for calcium. And the target level should be the lowest serum calcium that takes all your symptoms away. For most people, that'll be between eight and nine. But some folks may require a slightly higher serum calcium level. Now, why do we target such a low level of eight to nine when normal is 8.5 to 10.5? The reason for this is in the absence of PTH, most of the calcium in your blood goes right out into the urine. So high urine calcium is one of the major complications of treatment of hypoparathyroidism. If we keep your serum calcium 8 to 8.5, your urine calcium will pretty much be OK. Once we push your serum calcium to 9 or 9.5, then your urine calcium goes up to 3, 4, 500, and you are at risk of kidney stones. Does everybody here know what their urine calcium is? So there are two ways, two ways to do this. Let me go <coughs> Two ways to do this. <coughs> One is a spot urine. So that's a urine, you just pee in a cup in the doctor's office, you know, behind a curtain or something, I guess. But you get a spot sample. It's very quick, it's very easy to collect. 
and the doctor has to order calcium and creatinine in that sample. And we call that the calcium creatinine ratio. Yes. Find a new doctor. So the calcium creatinine ratio, and it should be less than 0 0.25. If your ratio is higher than 0 0.25, you need to go to the next step, which is a 24 hour urine collection. And that's all the urine you make from one morning to the next. And then in that sample, you should have calcium, creatinine, and sodium measured. Sodium, that's salt. Why do you need to know the sodium? Because high sodium intake drives calcium out of the body. So if you're having problems maintaining a consistent serum calcium level, it could be as simple as two margaritas on Tuesday, a bag of chips on Wednesday, and then no salt at all Thursday, Friday. The more salt you eat, the more calcium goes out in the urine. So when I evaluate a patient for a high urine calcium, I look at the ratio. If it's high, I collect the 24-hour urine, and then I look at calcium, creatinine, and sodium. And if the sodium is high, the first thing I do is let's cut back on salt. Yes? Exactly right. So, this looks like this looks just like water. <laughs> Hydrochlorothiazide reduces urinary calcium. Okay, so first things first. Salt increases urine calcium. How do I treat hypercalcemia in kids who are on calcitriol and calcium for hypoparathyroidism and their calcium is 12? I don't bring them into the hospital and stick IVs in them. I tell their parents, buy some potato chips, give them a whole lot of water, stop the calcitriol and calcium, and a day or two later, their calcium level is normal. So you can lower your calcium very easily by taking too much salt. So it's a good treatment for hypercalcemia, but it also will lower your calcium level in your blood by flushing out the calcium through your kidneys. Now, some patients, even on a low salt diet, will continue to have too much calcium in the urine. So that's where we use hydrochlorothiazide. Now, I prefer to use a drug called Mojuretic. And Mojuretic is a compound drug. It's two things in one, okay? It's hydrochlorothiazide and amylaride. And why that's a good combination is because both reduce urine calcium. Hydrochlorothiazide causes potassium wasting, but amylaride causes potassium saving. So it's a great combination. It's like Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. Okay, so I use Mojuretic instead of hydrochlorothiazide when there's continued high urine calcium and I've been unable to reduce that by going to a low salt diet. So I think your doctor may be well intentioned but not well read. These drugs do reduce urine calcium excretion by about 50%. But you can overcome those drugs with a high salt diet. So you have to be on a, high, a low salt diet at the first step. It's a step by step process. Low salt diet, for some patients, that's enough. For other patients, you have to add the next step, which is Mojuretic or hydrochlorothiazide. But when you add the medication, it doesn't mean that you stop the low salt diet. You need both. Okay, five minutes, all right. So what are the pitfalls? The pitfalls of the treatment that most patients are on are erratic levels of calcium with lows and highs and high urine calcium levels. So we want to avoid the highs and lows, 
So I think by spacing out the medications, taking calcium and calcitriol several times during the day, by knowing your serum phosphorus levels, by following your urinary calcium creatinine ratio, and if it's high, getting a 24-hour urine, calcium, creatinine, and sodium. And if your doctors don't know this, you can educate them. And if they won't learn, I think you need a new doctor. I think, you know, I, I hate to say it, but all of us uh, physicians today realize that we can learn from our patients. When I watch the, the, the national news on TV at 6.30, there are all these commercials for countless medications aimed at people my age and older. And every one of those commercials says, tell your doctor if, tell your doctor. And I, I sit there and I go, why doesn't the doctor just ask those questions? Doctors don't have enough time. So sometimes we have to, as patients, be empowered and we have to actually give the information to the doctor, point them in the right direction. And the best doctor is not necessarily the smartest doctor. The best doctor is the one who will adapt and change when new information is available. And sometimes that new information may come from patients. So we're collaborating. It's a, it's a partnership. These are chronic conditions, and you need to find a physician who will adapt to your needs, who will listen to you, and will learn from you. And that's all, that's all I've got to tell you this afternoon. So thank you.